Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to game day and the last day of virtual homecoming. My name is Ethan Burris. I'm the faculty and chair of the management department here at McCombs. And I'm very excited to welcome Chris Del Conte, uh, the director of UT Athletics, uh, interim dean uh, Lil Mills, and Kirk Goldsbury, who's a lecturer in the management department and who teaches in sports analytics, and also on the side writes for ESPN. Um, we are super excited to talk everything sports and business today. And so, uh, Chris, I'll, I'll start off with you. Um, obviously, everyone has felt the impact of, of COVID in lots of different ways. Uh, can you summarize how the pandemic has affected UT athletics and what we need to do to kind of get things back to back to normal? Well, if you look at this for a moment, it's good to be with you all. It's actually been uh, like this movie, The Perfect Storm. You saw that perfect storm with uh, uh, George Clooney. We have uh, three storms coming at one time. And we're this little boat, it's University of Texas Athletic Department. You have COVID, uh, which is a massive storm in, in itself and it's pandemic. Um, you have civil unrest, which is a, a significant storm in its own right. And then you have uh, economic downturn. And on top of it, you have the shroud of, of the presidential election. And all these things are going on at one time. And we're this little boat out in the middle of the ocean just trying to get home. We see, uh, we think we see uh, uh, a... Um, you know, uh, um, a lighthouse. And then this storm comes and blows us back out to another part of the, uh, of the ocean and we start making our way back in. So it's been very difficult. Uh, uh, and you think about COVID for us hit, uh, the pandemic hit for us. Uh, and we were playing a basketball game at, at, the, at the conference tournament, playing, getting ready to tip off against Texas Tech. And we get a phone call saying the tournament has been canceled. I literally had to walk on the court and tell our student athletes uh, the current tournament has been canceled. We're going home. Did not know what the uh, uh, what the rest of the summer would look like within three days. Um, all, all sports have been canceled, and all of a sudden we were to, to stay in place and start to figure out what the, what was going to look like. Um, so you move into the fall. We have a DKR sits roughly hundred thousand people, and that's an economic engine for our entire athletic program. And uh, when you're only to, when you're only allowed to have a twenty five percent of capacity. Uh, you're going to have a massive economic hit. We've had to make a lot of changes here in terms of furloughs, reduction of salary, asking our coaches to participate in reducing salaries for this year. A lot of things have taken place in order for us to continue to um, field an athletic program. And part of it is, is, as you all know, is we're run. Um, we have really two revenue sources, football and men's basketball. And I say we have uh, out of our 20 sports and we have 18 brand accentuators. Um, they don't necessarily bring in revenue, but they accentuate the brand of Texas. So uh, if we can get through this year, we have a plan to get us through this year. And uh, if there's a vaccine uh, moving forward, we'll be in good shape. But uh, this year is going to be a, a tightening of the belt and how we do things is, is been uh, is going to be critical for us for our salvation uh, in the next nine months. And so let me kind of build on that a little bit. So you, you mentioned, you know, the football and basketball being the revenue drivers for UT athletics. And now we have to balance that with some of the safety needs of student athletes, not to mention other employees and staff and our fans. So kind of walk me through what that decision-making process was like and how that evolved, uh, especially over the summer. Well, at the end, of the, it was funny at the beginning of the year, we thought in August or excuse me, May, we thought we were going to have about 50% attendance. So I was building a financial model and about 50% attendance knowing, okay, we're at 50%. Here's what we could do and how, here's how we're going to go about it. About August, we got word we needed to go down to 25% and social distance the entire stadium. And once we look at that financial model, then we realized that we we're going to be in a completely different shape moving in to our fiscal year. The good thing about the University of Te or, or the Texas system, our, um, our fiscal year started September 1. So I had a month to adjust what we were going to do. Um, and at that point in time, we just put a map in place, oversat the stadium and said, we're going to seat 25%. Uh, uh, Here's how we're going to seat it and how we're going to go through that, knowing that we're going to require masks, uh, certain entrance ways, concessions are going to be um, cashless, tickets are going to be ticketless. We did a lot of work in 30 days to put forth. And then right as we got to our first game, we had student testing uh, on campus and the students weren't exactly participating in willing uh, fashion to go get the COVID test. So we then instituted, if you want a big ticket to come to the game, you must have a COVID test um, uh, 24 hours before the game in order for us to uh, issue a, a ticket. So we were able to institute that on Friday. The first game, we had like 2,000 kids uh, 
come take the test. We had about 95 positives. The next game, we had about roughly the same amount of uh, uh, people take uh, the test, and we only had 12 positives. So mm-hmm. saw a dramatic de- decrease, uh, really worked on the campaign of wearing a mask, social distancing, and it, it's been uh, – but it's been challenging in every front because uh, we went from tickets to ticket list to cash list to we actually put machines around the stadium. If you don't have a, a, If you don't have a credit card, we can actually put in – money into a system and it'll spit you out a credit card that you can go use a concession. So a lot of work behind the scenes has been put in by the staff in order for us to get ready. But it was, um, again, we were building a financial model from May all the way to August on 50% attendance. So mm-hmm. things changed relatively quickly mm-hmm. and we'll do the same type of attendance at 25% for men's basketball, women's basketball, volleyball throughout the year, which will then have a, a significant impact on, on our finances for this current year. Let me switch gears a a little bit. Lil, um, hearing how Chris has approached this with UT Athletics, I I know being a department chair within McCombs, I've certainly seen a lot of parallels. So I was kind of wondering what what your experience has been like in helping to prepare faculty, students, and and staff for the fall. Thanks, Ethan. Since um, uh, Chris spoke about operational matters, I'll start there, and then I'll move to the academic side of the house. I think upstream of us, University of Texas had great planning all summer with a very wide task force. Here in Macombs on the operational side, we have a great facilities operation headed by our chief operating officer, Caitlin Mullaney. And it's so organized that the Macombs School of Business is frequently the beta tester for policies and building procedures here on campus. And so Caitlin's team organized reducing density in the classrooms and zip tying off seats, common spaces for health and safety guidelines, all of the hand sanitizing, all of the signage. And we're getting close to the end of the residential semester. And I think we're going to make it The city of Austin and UT campus infection rates are pretty low. To Chris's point, there are only 12 positives among the students wanting to pick up their football tickets recently. On the academic side of the house, Senior Associate Dean Eric Hurst was helping me make decisions about the course scheduling. And I'm really proud of McCombs faculty. They are courageous and practical and in large proportions were willing to come teach in person. Our real constraint was the health and safety density in the classroom. And so in the end, about half of our courses were in a hybrid format where students could learn in person. Uh, Unfortunately, since we had to move all the big classes fully online, the credit hours are disproportionately online but we feel like we were able to give students and parents options they were interested in. And I appreciate President Herzl uh, helping establish our fiscal reserves before he became our president and we could afford to invest even more heavily in classroom equipment to do it in an excellent way. So our enrollments were steady or better in both quantity and quality at the undergraduate level and our master's programs are booming. So uh, I know Chris can't put as many people in the stadium. We are at least educating as many people here on the academic side of the house. Excellent. So seeing a lot of both entrepreneurial and innovation efforts across both UT Athletics and and here within McCombs. Um, I'm gonna switch gears a a little bit again. Chris, I know one of the real exciting opportunities that's uh, emerging for UT is the opening of the brand new Moody Center. Um, So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that um, and what that venue will specifically bring to campus and athletics. Well, it was interesting. That was really a a brainchild of President Fembus when he hired me that he wanted to build a a new event center for the city of Austin for the University of Texas, partly because he wanted Irwin Center and the practice facility to uh, go away so they can expand the medical center. Um, so 
when uh, uh, when I when I was hired here, I read his plans of what he had thought, and and the idea was to build a brand new arena that was state of the art that Texas would own, but would be managed by OVG, and they would build it over a long term lease, and then the revenues from our sixty dates that Texas has, and the, and the arena would be ours, and then we would have a revenue share, in, in, in the rest of those dates, partnering with OVG and Live Nation, which controls probably ninety percent of the concert market for us was critical because we only play, we only use that gym of roughly around 60 times a year. Right. So for 300 and, uh, uh, you know, 305 times, they're going to have that arena for concerts. And if you look at uh, um, music today, a lot of that industry is making, is making their revenue on, on, on live music. So to have a uh, bands come in, uh, uh, Austin, come into Houston, Austin, Dallas was critical on the road tour and how they were going to go about it and having live nation be a partner with that has been, spectacular so in the early first quarter of 22 we'll have a a, a little under about a 400 million dollar brand new arena mm-hmm. for the city of austin the university of texas it'll be owned by texas managed by obg and live nation and then at the same time we're building a brand new practice facility for our men's women's basketball team and our, and our rowing team that'll be spectacular state of the art and then that'll allow the university then to uh begin the process of, of taking down the Irwin Center um, and Cooley to expand the medical center well, was their thought. So um, it's, a, it's a great way for us to partner. Um, it's a great way for us to build a new arena with no expense to the university. Um, I think everyone would be happy about that. But at the end of the day, having an arena that seats roughly 10,000 for basketball, 15,000 for concerts and a practice facility put us in a, in a position to have the finest uh, uh, athletic facilities in the country for our men's women's basketball program. So I'm truly excited about that. And the key key, the, the, the key here is FRWE, which is spectacular. <laughs> hey, I want to, I want to jump in now that we're talking about basketball finally and good news. Uh, so Chris, I know you got a lot on your plate. Will, I know you got a lot on your plate, but you know, with my background in the NBA, I look at this arena as one of the most exciting things happening in Austin, Texas. And in Texas, Chris, take us, Take us through some of your favorite features of this thing. I I personally think we're going to have the best basketball venue in the state of Texas, if not beyond. Why is that from your perspective? What are you most excited about with this new building? Well, from just a fan, from a fan perspective, the sidelines, right? We're, we're making an intimate facility. We, uh, one of the things we instituted was uh, um, the, 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 the steep greatness of the seats or fans. We write on top. It is going to be a basketball venue. First and foremost, we have great uh, entertainment, entertainment spaces for our, for our fans in, in terms of the clubs we're going to have the amenities mm-hmm. the upper deck of the stadium is actually going to have a garage door component that you will never see the upper the cavernous of the upper of, of the upper deck as they'll be completely closed off um, with video boards and screens that create a very intimate environment a little bit like what the atlanta uh, uh, falcons have done so you'll end up having a stadium that for concerts, we'll seat 15,000. For men's and women's basketball, we'll seat intimate 10,000 seats. Could go bigger if need be, but you're going to create um, great seating for that entire uh, enterprise. And uh, when you have a state-of-the-art facility such as this, it's not often that that uh, uh, that uh, athletic departments get a chance to be to build a brand new basketball arena. And for us, they usually just remodel old ones. So this is going to be really, really state of the art and all the bells and whistles with all the new te- technology. OVG is really excited about this opportunity because they've had, uh, they've built basketball arenas around the country, um, namely the Staples Center back in the day. And it's going to be a lot more um, intimate than that when you start to think about what we're doing. So I think the seat selections, sight lines, the amenities for fans, the opportunity for a student out to have a first class training facility. It's, uh, it's pretty spectacular. Yeah, I can tell you that NBA teams around the state are already looking uh, at the arena uh, with excitement. And I I assume it's going to have a huge impact um, with that new facility you're talking about, the new practice facility to to make a new pitch to some of the best recruits in the region and beyond uh, for our men's and women's basketball program. So I I can't say how I'm excited. I mean, the beautiful thing that I said that sticks out to me, Chris, and, and you didn't say it, there's so much to love about this building. Uh, but some of these outdoor spaces, you know, Austin is great for our, our climate uh, during basketball season. Mm-hmm. And isn't it true that, that some of the fans can actually hang out outside before the game or at halftime and, and there'll be some views that, that are pretty spectacular from that place? 
When you just look at the picture behind you, if you just keep it up for a moment, you yeah. can see uh, uh, you can see right behind you the entire way. That's a, that's like a balcony that goes over 360 of the entire city. So that's a big balcony outside with couches, fireplaces, mm-hmm. you name all the amenities. You can come out and have great events overlooking uh, the city. Right in front of the arena, there's basically an 8,000 seat amphitheater that we're going to have outdoor concerts oh. in. So you can have two things going on at one time. Live Nations really spent a lot of time in detail in creating multi-use spaces, uh, 365. So coming to a basketball game and you can have an outside concert going on, much like what we did with football this year, or creating Bebo Boulevard in the midway and all the things that go around our stadium. We'll do similar versions of that around basketball, but also around our concerts, around graduation. So remember, now we're going to have graduations. and It's a great place for our students to come graduate from at the same time having spaces around for, for photographic opportunities, but yet celebra- celebratory opportunities as well. So it's um, it's going to be, uh, it is the finest facility being built in the country, but the way it's designed, the way it's going to uh, fit in that particular space and the views of our great city, it's second to none. Okay. I'm excited. Uh, you can see right behind you, all that picture all the way around is a 360 plaza up top. That's really spectacular. I don't know if anyone can see the picture yeah. It's mucho bueno. The view, I just want to say one last thing. I mean, the view from up there, uh, from what I've been told, is going to be a spectacular view of downtown Austin. And, and, and just, it's unlike any arena. I've been to every arena in the country, I swear to God. And uh, there's very few where you can walk outside and have an enjoyable experience with your family, your friends. And yeah, whether it's a concert uh, evening, uh, you know, some of, some of the best nights in Austin have just beautiful weather outside. And this, Usually when you go to a basketball game, you don't get the opportunity to, to in, in, engage outside with your with your friends. But this is going to change that. I'm super excited, uh, not just for the basketball, but as you mentioned, um, the tremendous cultural uh, activities that are going to come to our campus because of this incredible new building. Um, but yeah, I'm a basketball guy, and I think this is going to put basketball in Austin, Texas in a brand new position uh, and, and it couldn't be better. I'm, I'm super psyched. So congrats to everybody involved with this project. Well, one of the things that's striking to me is uh, a lot of what Chris is talking about, this intersection of architecture and kind of the physical building, it's beautiful design, how, how people interact with it and then how that impacts the entire experience. And I know we've just been through something similar with the building of Rolling Hall and we're also just starting to embark on this process with the new Mulva and Hildebrand Hall. And so I was wondering if you can kind of talk a little bit about the educational benefits and how the physical buildings really impact that type of experience. Thanks so much, Ethan. Back in 2018, we opened a new building for our MBA students, Rolling Hall. And for the first time, we were able to provide a space where students could interact both among themselves and with faculty so much better. And we just hired a new professor in um, Ethan's department, Uh, a new assistant professor, Buki Akinsanmi, was an architect before she got her PhD in management. And she's presently conducting research on whether innovation in complex tasks improves when the physical space facilitates the interactions. And uh, many high-tech companies are trying to create random interactions among their colleagues by the way the physical space is configured. And we are looking for the same sort of collaborative physical space for both our faculty members and our undergraduate students. And to do so, we're working with UT's campus planning to identify building sites um, and raising funds presently. And together with substantial naming gifts already by Jim Mulva and Mindy Hildebrand for Mulva Hall and Hildebrand Hall, we've already raised 88 million toward the building you know, the start shovel in the ground goal of 135 million. And I couldn't be more excited to see the collaborations we observe over among our graduate students being fully available to our undergraduates and faculty. 
And honestly, the fact that COVID came in 2020 and we have not yet finalized architectural plans seems like a silver lining that things that uh, made things harder educationally during COVID, like stadium seating with bolted on chairs, uh, we'll know not to do that when we design a new building so that we will have much more flexibility for all kinds of things as we're now in this century. So I, I couldn't be more excited uh, and I hope uh, it will be as grand and uh, as Moody Arena in its academic way as it can be. Well, with $85 million, if you don't mind just letting me have a little bit of that, would be real nice. You know, we can maybe do a joint venture since between you, you and now President Harsley, you had her just cleaning up, really just ridiculous. So save some for us, okay? I mean, help us out. Well, speaking of joint ventures, um, the intersection of business and, and sports, you know, Chris, we've, we've talked a lot about this over the last year or so and how, um, how the business of sports as, as an industry has just rapidly changed. Can you could talk us through some of those changes and trends and especially how the role of like data and analytics um, uh, enters into that conversation? Well, I think it's just ops, everything's a, a evolution, right? And, and you think about uh, a sport is uh, we're running the enterprise based on people's passion. And we can't thank our donors enough for, for their passion for the university and for those that buy a season ticket and for those that participate and donate to our great university and to our athletic program. Because of their passion and fan base, we're allowed to have an opportunity for 523 student athletes to come to the University of Texas and get a great degree. Um, and that's just been uh, uh, solely because of, uh, of fans and their opportunities that they allow us. But then you have the advent of technology and all of a sudden television now has is, is come in and has infused a significant amount of revenue into an athletic program. And when you think about Title IX is the greatest thing that's ever happened in college athletics, an opportunity for women to participate in sport when that was enacted in the early 70s. However, there was no funding mechanism behind it. They said, this is what you're going to do. And then you're going to have to figure out a way to fund it within your own athletic program. And that's when football uh, and basketball have taken a greater uh, a, um, a greater emphasis in what we're doing in terms of, of, of generating revenue to support all 20 of our sports. That being said, we have technologies coming in and we're looking at technology in terms of how with the, with the, with the Facebook and social media and all those platforms, you see those influencers coming in now and how they're generating revenue, how they're generating advertising dollars by what they do and how they're going about it. We've also taken that opportunity then to look at what we do within our own shops to try to create um, new revenue streams so we can support our athletic program as far. And, and all that is driven by data. We had tremendous amount of data that we've, we, we had. We never knew what to do with it. Hmm. I mean, if you go down to our bookstore right now in our team shop, we, we have uh, uh, we, we, many, many people come in and buy shirts, T-shirts, Chosky's, whatever it is. We had their data. We never knew how to mine it. We never knew how to call them up, call them, talk to them, engage our fan base. Anyone who buys a season ticket, we just call them and thank them. But we never knew how to go back and do some research on that individual to see if they could be a, a, a long-term donor to us. So this, this new wave in, uh, uh, of information is coming in. We're now looking at how to mine that. From a, from a monetary standpoint. Same time, we're taking that uh, data analytics that's used in uh, pro sports in terms of those student, those, those pro players knowing where they shoot, where they're, they're most consistent with their shot. A, a person will say, God, I feel great here. Well, if you show them the data that you're absolutely garbage at that shot, but you're great over here, take it here, and you can start to uh, formulate a pattern for our, for our coaches and student athletes to see this is where you're going to be more successful. And Best teams are those that play together the most and uh, try to find an opportunities for everyone to be successful. So data is critical in what we're doing, but also we're just a neophyte in terms of how we are going to then start to capitalize on that revenue and that data that we're getting, we're, we're, we're now uh, bringing to college athletics. The NFL, Major League Baseball, um, the NBA, when they, when they sneeze, we catch a cold and we're just catching up and we have a long ways to go. So you've talked a lot about the need for business schools to offer more dedicated curricula around kind of the business of sports. Um, 
So can, can you give us a little bit more flavor about where that comes from and, you know, some of the conversations that we've had and that you've encouraged us to think about and developing over at, at, at McCombs? Oh, I, w- I would I would absolutely love for us to have a major in McCombs in terms of sports business, because it, the, the old way back and think about this. I have an operating budget of two hundred twenty five million dollars. Just think conception. That, that, that's a, that's a pretty good small company right now. Mm-hmm. Two hundred twenty five million dollars. And how, where does that money come from? And how does it uh, distribute? If you look at you had someone has a, just a general uh, uh, MBA he's going to come into athletics and go, gosh, dang it. Nothing makes sense here because if you had 20 shampoo products and only two made money, would you keep those other 18? Probably not. So we're running a failed business model. How does that work? And how does television work? How does the infuse of technology? How are we going to do just the basics of sports? When I got in, it used to be that you were a coach, then you became an AD, and you're really a scheduler. And all of a sudden now, the complexity of the business has completely changed. And um, if you think about this, I have compliance, which is just rules and regulations and the, and the, and the manuals this thick. We have sports medicine and doctors and psych, uh, psychiatrists and mental health people. And then you go into our academic services and then you go into um, um, our, our Forever Texas program is, gar- is giving them jobs. The whole complexity of the jobs has changed, but the business of the, of the enterprise is just magnified. We outsource our revenue. We outsource our marketing rights to IMG which they turn around and write us a check for $38 million. Mm. Well, how are they doing that? How, what, what's going on with that? It's, uh, this is why, in, in my mind, for you all, to, to so many kids that want to go into a sport or they want to be a part of the business operation, they think, oh, I'm going to go work in the NFL or Major League Baseball, I'm going to do this. Yeah, we're not teaching them the basics of the business. Uh, and we're not bringing them involved. We have a sports manager program here, but it's really theoretical-based. So we, I would love for you all to have a, a major that's really about the sports business science from analytics all the way up to um, operating an athletic program on a, on, a, on a daily basis because those nuances can be shared everywhere. But if we had that, we'd be top of the heap in the country because uh, no one's doing me, that. Yeah, let me hop in there because I see the same thing. You know, I used to hire people at the San Antonio Spurs front office, and there's no – reliable training grounds for people in those positions running sports organizations to find talent that's ready to hit the hit the hit the ground running uh and you know ethan i'll get you to talk about our progress for for chris here in a minute because you got some bragging points there but yeah the the vision we see at mccombs i think is is simply that we want to prepare people that are so passionate so many young people want to work in the sports industry and they just don't know how to get there. Uh, and we want to start there. And, and with the, the concepts that we're already talking about here today, sports is an increasingly analytical realm. Sports business is increasingly a uh, huge business uh, that, that requires real complex training. Uh, the kinds of stuff that McCombs already trains people for. We just need to decorate around the edges with a little bit of sports content for these young folks so that these learners can go get jobs in sports. My TA uh, last year, the great Catherine Rowe, who you met several times, Chris, who helped UT Athletics in their ticket department, just got hired by Kraft Analytics in New England. I mean, one of the best organizations in pro sports found the perfect student for their next big job from our program. And we kind of did that by accident. I want to start doing that on purpose. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know Chris does too. And Lil, I know you do too. But Ethan, you've been asking the questions all day. Here's the question. Give us an update and where our sports business minor slash major is. Well, we don't have a major quite yet, but we are tracking towards a a minor. Um, So we have a lot of the approvals already uh, buttoned up across campus. Um, the, the minor will be an intersection of really three different areas. One is business foundations. So do we understand the economics and the, and the strategies that uh, athletic organizations can employ to be successful? Uh, the second is around analytics. So can you understand and draw insights from data to help execute that strategy? And the third, which I think is pretty unique, and that is what is different about the sports arena and industry 
that is different from a lot of others. And so Chris, you mentioned a lot of the constraints around 18 products that aren't very profitable and two that very much are. Well, that's that's a difference. And that is something that's fundamental and unique to sports. And so giving our students exposure to kind of all three different areas is really what we're striving towards here. Um, we, If everything tracks uh, going forward, we should have approvals not only finish this semester, um, but through the college and university next semester to have a soft launch by the fall of 21 and hopefully a hard launch in the course catalog by the fall of 22. So we're excited about being able to uh, offer our, our students the opportunity to not only um, develop their business skills, but hone that in as specifically in an area that they're passionate about around sports. I'm um, excited to uh, hopefully throw a few of those students your way. Well, I mean, I think that's that's what's critical. If you look at learn by doing, right? And if you look at the Macomb School, it is the greatest college we have on this campus. And uh, if you get into Macomb School from out of high school, you pretty much know that that that, that track when you graduate, uh, uh, your trajectory is through the roof, right? And part of that is, we're when I go and hire, I'm hiring attorneys to become our compliance coordinators. They're right out of law school, but they're they're learning on the job. If we could then partner with you and say, okay, here's here's a, here's someone that wants to become a CEO uh, um, or, or, or CFO of an athletic program. You get them in on the ground floor and they start to work their way up. And they have internships that can come here. They can bounce from anywhere in the country. Remember, there's 3,500 academic institutions in the country that all have athletic programs. There's 32 pro teams on, in both Major League Baseball, and NBA, and NFL. There's so many more minor league teams, but the I, the nuances of business and college athletics is something that if you get in early and you can tr- you can they can train. I'll give you an example, uh, Dean. You're, you're going to laugh your rear end off, but I was a development guy, and then they made me one day the CFO. I'm like, what are you talking about? We don't do zero based budgeting in athletics. We do it now because I went and read a book over a weekend. I go, okay, this is what we're going to have to do. And then became an expert in how we are then going to, because what ends up happening is that ah, we'll just give you 10% more next year. Every athletic budget, ah, we'll just give you, give me your stuff, what you're going to do. We didn't have a budget at the University of Texas till I got here. What we did was just tell us what you need. Now we're doing zero-based budget all the way up to each sport. So at the beginning, at the end of the year, I know exactly what we're doing. I hand our coaches their budgets and say, this is what it is. We built your budget. We know every coach has areas in there where they throw a little fat in there. And uh, we, we monitor that pretty closely to see where that fat is. But now we're creating a zero-based budget opportunity for every uh, for every sport and every unit, which that was never the case here, nor was that the case anywhere else I worked at until they told me I was in charge of that area. And I'm like, well, I went from development to now this particular component, went down to the li- border uh, or, or um, went down to the library, or not the library, the, 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 the borders, the old bookstore, bought me two books and came back and became an expert pretty much uh, over the course of a year. Well, now you're speaking Lil's language, being a, a, an accounting professor, understanding all the nuances of different types of budgeting. Although as a department chair, I really like the notion of just saying what I want. And then that's what my, my boss ends up giving me the next year for a budget. That's ridiculous. Plus 10%, right? <laughs> plus, hey, look, can you, you know, think about it. Yeah, plus 10%. And that's that's what they were doing. It was just such a weird component in, in how we un- operated our budget. So you just got 10%. But imagine if you're an accountant and you come in and you build and you look at an athletic budget and you have two revenue streams. You're constantly robbing Peter to pay Paul all year. And mm-hmm. then you land that plane real, you know, gingerly as you're cruising down the runway. You're going, I mean, there's times where I work in athletic programs, okay. No expenditures for the month of May when I was a June fiscal year. And I put all the bills in my pocket, in, in my drawer, and then paid them after the fiscal year was over. I mean, it was ridiculous. So this the idea now of just changing the fundamental business model needs to be taught, needs to be integrated within our athletic program. And I, and I, and I share that with the three of you all and anything that you're building from analytics up. We have a sports management program. It's all theory based. Mm. They read it. They're not working within the athletic department. So for you all to have something that was going to be um, uh, um, a, a true minor that we could then get them involved early, that way then we can say, okay, here's how we're going to produce. We're, we're, we're producing the next great person coming out of Macombs that wants to be in the sports industry, just like we have this great network called Longhorn Network, and we're, not, we're now just finally partnering with Moody. I said, why don't you have a sports minor 
that then you could then use ESPN as a platform to start to get those young people saying, I produce shows for ESPN, they can go get a job, right? That, that's the whole idea is come to college to get a job, right? Yeah. For 90% of them, or they want to be the three of you all. But for 90%, they're coming here, get a great degree in Macomb to go make a killing so then Lil can go ask him for some money after the fact. There you go. So I have um, just one last question here. So, you know, we have a tremendous legacy with Red McCombs. Um, in, in many ways, he embodies the intersection of business and sports. He's wildly successful in, in, in both venues. And his legacy specifically within McCombs continues to shape both the athletics department, but also the business school. Um, both Will and Chris, I'm, I'm wondering if you can both comment on, on Red's legacy. I know it's, um, uh, it's kind of a special time in, in terms of, of that gift, Lil. You, I, I know you can speak to that. Um, but ultimately, the question I want to ask is, how, how, how can we do a better job of ensuring our students and our student athletes that are passionate about these areas um, can really thrive at both business and in some of these areas within sports as well? So... Well, maybe I'll start, Ethan, and I made sure that in my background you can see the portrait of Red McCombs because we're celebrating the 20-year anniversary of his transformative $50 million naming gift to the McCombs School of Business, and that 20 years was transformative because we could hire recruit, retain ever more prominent professors, and it allowed us to compensate in a way to attract the best talent. And with the right talent, because we are in a human capital business, just like Chris is, who are the players on the field, we've been rising in the rankings as our students have increased in excellence. And business education's in high demand here at UT, and we know we've got limited capacity for business majors. So with help of programs and department chairs like Ethan, we have expanded as quickly and as widely as possible a lot of minors so that any student at UT that wants some business education can get it. It's a, it starts with the business foundations that's a minor in business with kind of sleeves off of it in public policy or energy management. Entrepreneurship is a huge cross-campus venture. Global management, healthcare innovation, international business, sales, real estate, and risk management. And we're really proud that there's 110 student athletes, including 25 football players, who are either in the Macomb School or, or participating in a business minor where they are getting some business education. And I also understand over in the athletics department, they're also working on more personal financial planning for student athletes because uh, some of them graduate and just take jobs like the rest of us. Others of them do manage to go into pro sports careers where you might be very wealthy for a short amount of time, and that deserves some personal financial planning. Um, and I'm proud that my colleague, Michael Clement, who's chair of the Department of Accounting, has such a close relationship over as the faculty athletic rep uh, so that he can be of any service to Chris uh, that is needed. And that helps link um, Chris's student athletes needs to what we can do here at McCombs. It's awesome. When you think about this, I think Mr. McCombs, just his family embodies both. Uh, he's been a, one of the most successful business owners in the state of Texas. And yes. you think about where he came from, from Spur, Texas, and the enterprise that he's built in San Antonio and, and, and the state. Um, it's been phenomenal. He's so diversified. And then he got in a sport, his passion of sport. I mean, his first team he owned was a minor league baseball team. I want to believe in Corpus Christi. And, um, and then that entered into buying the Spurs, the, the Houston Rockets, the Denver Nuggets, uh, the Minnesota Vikings. Um, and he's the first individual that really 
took business principles that he was doing in, in, in creating one of the most successful car businesses in the country into one of the most successful pro enterprises in the country, uh, ownership enterprises. And uh, I love talking to him because he's so passionate about both. He's so passionate about business. He's so passionate about sport and how he married those two. And for him to have his name on our stadium, the red zone, and then our, our greatest college at the university of Texas to bear his name just tells you his love for this institution. But when you get a chance to spend time with him, his personal story is just remarkable. Uh, um, from where he where he started to where, what he's done today, and in his philanthropic spirit that lives on through his family is second to none. But his name will always be synonymous with the University of Texas, and that's um, that's that's a, an unbelievable honor. But it tells you about uh, his fourth right and his thought process that uh, education first and foremost will change one person's life. And he firmly believed that through education at the University of Texas, you can change your paradigm. And uh, uh, he allowed that to happen with a tremendous gift to uh, to our university, created one of the greatest colleges. And you can see it expanding every uh, uh, every single day in the rank, moving up in the rankings. I know she just mentioned Michael Clement is overseas, the number one accounting program in the country. And I always tell him he became chair there. I wouldn't want to be a chair when it's already number one. You want to be like it's three, you took it to one. Because then all you can do is go down. But he's a great professor, great mind, and he's great for our student athletes. And what we just mentioned was financial literacy for our student athletes is critical. And not only when they go and make it, if you get a check for two, three, four, or $10 million, what what are you going to do with that? And how are you going to do it? How are you going to be financially literate to make sure you put yourself in a position where you save a nest egg for, for, for generations to come? So... Um, the partnerships are great. The legacy of, of the McCombs, the name is second to none at the University of Texas. I think that's a wonderful way to kind of sum up uh, everything that we're doing at this intersection of both McCombs and UT Athletics. I, I know some of the things that Kirk and I have been working on and building out the Sports Institute within McCombs uh, certainly helps to uh, further that vision to give uh, an area of passion for our students the tools and the skills and the concepts they need to, to succeed. And so we're, we're excited about this partnership and looking forward to, uh, to con continue to build it out. Um, so in closing, I'd, I'd really like to thank all three of you for, for your time. Um, really enjoyed the conversations, especially around the importance of, at the intersection of, of business and sports. Um, thank you all for participating in the McCombs homecoming. Good luck to the game this week and, um, and hook them. Look at the